The team I was on was called National Purposes. That was named by Congress. Uh, and essentially, we were asking the question of, if you have infrastructure, what's it good for? Why did you build this infrastructure? And we broke that down into six teams based on a sort of larger list of, of domain uh, areas that the Congress asked us to look at, energy and the environment, government operations, transparency, public safety, economic opportunities, access to jobs, healthcare and education. So that's a pretty good range of the federal government sort of uh, civilian service areas. I led the team that built the education plan. And I worked closely with the other members of the, uh, of the other national purposes teams and had uh, a fair bit of interaction with the deployment and adoption folks. So let's just take a look at the framework for recommendations. Again, as I said, the university sector obviously has a large number of needs, but you have also shown the way for a lot of solutions that other people don't have. And so we had to balance those two constraints as we were designing up uh, for recommendations. Uh, so the recommendations that we developed, one, because you can't say uh, education, internet, FCC, and not say E-rate. So we uh, produced a lot of recommendations for E-rate. That's really largely not relevant for this audience, except insofar as you work with your local uh, K-12 school districts uh, and libraries. So those are the two constituents who receive E-rate funds from the FCC. That's a two and a quarter billion dollar a year program running since 1997, running to this day. Uh, we also looked at community colleges, and in fact what we found was a, a remarkable disparity between the connectivity available at community colleges and the connectivity at four-year institutions. Uh, supporting and promoting online learning, so we'll go into these a little bit, uh, but we really thought, and this is full system, this is from uh, lower grades all the way through uh, higher education and, 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 and research you know, out into the uh, training fields and whatnot as you, after, uh, to, after your terminal degree. Uh, but we really saw a tremendous amount of power in the emergence of online learning solutions and their potential for the future. And this is, to me, one of the greatest areas of value proposition that internet networks, high speed in particular, offer to society and that you can use potentially as a vehicle or as a, a, uh, a chip, if you will, to communicate between the people who you need to consume your services and the people who need to fund your services in order to grow and expand the networks that you're developing. Uh, in addition, unlocking the power of data to personalize learning and improve decision making, we really saw a tremendous opportunity. And this is, uh, you know, uh, Mellon Foundation, uh, the president there did a study not too long ago looking at uh, higher education data, finding what the big impacts were on graduation rates, uh, success in higher ed, and he found surprisingly, for example, that uh, SAT scores, the raw SAT score, was not nearly as, uh, as a great a predictor as the grade you got in school. And in fact, the specialized subject areas were the second greatest predictor. So the actual SAT score itself turned out not to be as impactful in his research as some of the other points of data that he could collect. Now, we don't have an ability in an, as, an, as uh, individual states or even beyond that to conduct this kind of research on a wholesale level. He had to do this through force of personality and finance. Uh, and uh, the proposition that a widely connected network could create that kind of interconnectivity is a huge promise that we've been sort of working towards for a long time, but I sometimes feel like it's a bit of a treadmill and uh, we would like to see some uh, and we produce some recommendations to see how to drive that. So this is just an overall reflection so you know who I am, <laughs> right? So I'm on, I think, the right side of this. Um, I really love the Internet, and I've been working with it since the 80s, and, uh, and I've been hacking on computers since the late 70s uh, with the 300 baud modems and all this stuff. So I just love connectivity. I love the opportunities. You know, as new technologies emerge, I'm often feeling like, they're, they're arriving whole formed, you know, that they, these, these new ideas, whether it's Wikipedia, Facebook, Twitter, whatever it is, uh, these ideas uh, want to exist and then somebody goes out and puts the vehicle in which the, the desire can be filled, right? And that, I don't know if you all feel that way, but I just really enjoy being around this environment, so I just wanted you to know that. But uh, let's, let's look at the future for broadband infrastructure a little bit, and these are just some reflections, and I'll look forward to an interactive dialogue. Um, I should keep an eye on my time. Uh, but I, I have a proposition for you, which is uh, to uh, quote uh, Tom Wolfe, no Buck Rogers, no Bucks. And this is a 
funny inversion, right? You would think, well, if you can't spend the money, you're not going to get the guy to the moon. And his point, which is, uh, if you don't have the astronauts, nobody wants to fund your infrastructure. Nobody wants to build a rocket unless you have an astronaut, right? They don't just want to send, uh, you know, a computer into space, right? Now, the robots that we've got now are an interesting sort of inversion on this concept, and I think that how they promise to change the way infrastructure is viewed with internet technology is an, is an interesting proposition. But as of right now, it's people connecting to people that is a value proposition for the internet, right? And so we have to keep that in mind as we're trying to expand the internet. Um, so that's the concept of utility driving demand, but there's this performance aspect or this visibility aspect that I think we have to keep in mind. And that's why I said just asking you to look outside of your role in in making strategic decisions about what networks to build or how to keep those networks running at high degrees, there's also this concept that we have to be connecting up to that uh, Buck Rogers. Uh, so broadband utility and education, these are some issues that I think are critical in terms of establishing this value, and I would love to get your feedback. Single sign-on and identity management. And when I talk about identity, I'm not just talking about individuals or individual roles or that authorization problem, which is so horrific in many cases, but also the identity management of the other institutional assets. So whether it's content or courses or rooms or, you know, we're talking about this highly censored world that we're heading to with IPv6, uh, all of those things sort of play in identity management. So when I want to connect the right student to the right teacher, right, that's one problem, but I need to get the, the, the finances lined up, I need to get the course scheduling lined up, I need to get the content to those people, it needs to be the right content, it needs to be customized, individualized. All of those things have identity problems. Uh, purchasing and license acquisition, right, that's easy. <laughs> uh, I think this mic is on too, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna point that some other direction. Alrighty. Uh, so I'm not supposed to talk about uh, when I was at the FCC maybe so much about remix, reburn, uh, you know, these sorts of concepts, but, uh, but they exist and, uh, and I think our infrastructure needs to support them natively. And there's a lot of interesting opportunities out there to support this kind of stuff for remixing culture. But remixing culture in the educational environment is an interesting proposition for me about the content that you're delivering. Right? So I just met with a, a woman who manages four high schools in a charter management organization yesterday. She's pulling in content that a lot of universities are producing, but she's doing it by hand. Right? And then she's remixing that in a way that's going to be suitable curricula for a range of students in an urban environment. Now, the internet makes that work possible, but, it, but when she's done, she's done. And when her program money drives up, she sort of wraps up that curriculum and it disappears. And this is a problem in the infrastructure world that we, de that we deal with. We, we have a concept, uh, I got trained in archeology span called uh, land desk capital intensification, which you don't have to repeat. But uh, in this world, we're talking about knowledge intensification and capital intensification. If your infrastructure isn't encouraging and permitting people to build on the work that's come before, then you're really just waiting for the next budget crunch to lose everything that you've done and to lose the value that the network's created. So uh, Wikipedia is the easiest example to play this out on. Wikipedia, as everyone makes adjustments to the network infrastructure that Wikipedia cr uh, uh, offers, which is knowledge about the world, right, these articles, the changes reflect the past and the current revision. And so as the future goes forward, that knowledge is intensified time and time again. If you'd asked me if Wikipedia would have worked in 1991, I would have said it's impossible. It just doesn't fit human nature, and I was wrong. And that's just a really exciting discovery about the way that humans interact with each other, and the network makes that possible. So I just want you to, as much as possible, uh, engage with me and each other about these concepts. Um, communities can't find each other. This is kind of another identity problem. Uh, that we can get into in some detail. Uh, communities, uh, communities exist, right, for, to serve their own need. But you look on the internet, there's so many communities. How do I find the one that's relevant to me? This is a huge recommendation problem. The right answer is out there, but how do I get to that person who has the right answer? Or how do I get to the answer that's already been solved? Google does a lot for us, but uh, this, this problem is just scratching the surface of this f uh, connecting communities. Uh, Users control their data. So this is an interesting problem uh, that I, uh, I just want to uh, talk about very briefly. 
uh, with regard to stovepipes. So in the traditional privacy model, your obligation to your students is to make sure that no one ever gets to the data, right? But if you think about this from the student's perspective, they just don't want people they don't want to have access to the data. But there are other people that they absolutely do want to have access to the data. So a high school student, do you think that they want the college they're applying to to have access to their data? Sure they do. Do you think that employer that they're trying to get the job from, they want to provide access to their data? Of course they do. They're going around, running around, getting transcripts, getting printouts, doing all the things that they need to do to get access to data which is locked up. And that's not value for them, right? That's anti-value. So the privacy, the way we're conceptualizing it today, might not be the way we need to conceptualize it in the future, which is the obligation on the part of the provider is to make sure that the data are available where the client wants them available. So it's really talking to you about being a conduit rather than an endpoint or a stovepipe. So just throw some ideas out here, right? Um, so instrumentation. Uh, we can do a lot with instrumentation in the network. You guys are uh, leading the way, so I don't need to go too deep into that one. Uh, multiple voices, I'm gonna skip for time. Uh, diverse relevance and recommendation are already addressed to some extent, but the notion that if you have an open network, you can have diverse relevance and recommendation engines running. You don't have to have the definitive answer to how the network works. And of course, Google and other players, uh, Bing from Microsoft and these guys, are solving this problem on a generalized level. But there are a lot of specific industries that just don't have this answer solved. And I think that if you look in the curricular content area in education, universities and K-12, this problem is wide open right now. And it's going to get solved. And it's going to get solved on the network. So you all are part of it. And your networks are going to help solve it. So I just want to sort of establish that. And we're, we're going to work on it, both at the federal level, state level, and and in the universities.